Uh, I first became involved with the Friends of Women's Studies in the process of developing the archive, which was at the time just the Women's Archive. So uh, that was the occasion of my becoming involved, uh, and that was in 94, I think, or 5. Uh, so we've been involved ever since, uh, and uh, we, since we were integrally involved in the formation of the archive, we established early on a cooperative relationship with the archivist, and we're sort of the on-the-ground people out there with our ears open, uh, along with everybody else. Uh, so, but we're particularly alert to uh, following up on leads that sound like they would lead to good collections of papers um, in all realms of women's endeavor in Houston, uh, and bringing them to the archivist and consulting about the appropriateness and uh, moving forward from there. Uh, we are an interdisciplinary minor, uh, both at the graduate and undergraduate level, and that means that students study uh, courses that have to do with gender and or women or sexuality uh, in all disciplines. Uh, so you might put your minor together involving classes from sociology, classes from biology, classes from English literature, any, you know, any discipline that does work in that area. Uh, and uh, because we're making connections between the way gender functions in all realms of life. And so the Schuert Archive then becomes a resource for classes uh, throughout the curriculum because the papers collected here are for also from all realms of endeavor uh, that women participate in in, in the city. So you, if you were taking religious studies classes, you could come and explore the Church Women United papers or other collections that had to do with religion. Or if you were taking sociology classes, you could come and look basically at all of the uh, collections since they're um, evidence of women's social action. Um, and so with all the disciplines, uh, you know, literature, you could come look at the Wivla papers, art, you could come look at the uh, Women's Caucus for Art. Um, so the interdisciplinarity of the Schuert Women's Archive uh, supports the work that's done in all the courses uh, who can draw on the resources here. Okay. Well, the the exhibit will be an entryway for students who don't really know much about the archive to get a sense of what's there, and then we hope they'll come and um, seek to do more research uh, in the collections that they are particularly interested in that they see in the exhibit, uh, and that will give them access to a sense of what women have been doing in Houston all along, because that story hasn't always been as well represented uh, in the wider public realm as, as it should be. Uh, everything. <laughs> everything that women uh, do, women, uh, we've discovered, uh, are active in all realms of the city. Uh, and historically, they've um, there hasn't been as much uh, support for women being active in the public realm. So women's organizations are the way that women have had an effect on civic life because they're sort of quasi-public, quasi-private. And so uh, since the 19th century, women's organizations have been um, an important part of the function of the city, but also of the um, uh, allowing the participation of of women in that function. So they worked in terms of social welfare, they worked in professional organizations, they worked in religious, you know, things like gardening, the arts, um, and in politics. So um, across the board, women have been active, uh, and that uh, led to our collection policy on women's organizations because that was the place where you were most likely to find records of what women were doing. Women were always doing things, but they didn't always keep records. 
of their individual work. So as um, more women are individually active, as women in public life is more common, uh, we seek to also uh, collect the papers of individual women. So we'll continue to do that. Uh, so, you know, and that's across the board. But uh, also women have continued to be active in groups. So um, they don't seem to be giving up on that, so we'll continue to collect them. <laughs>
uh, and being part of the Friends uh, is how active women have been actually all along. And uh, for instance, um, Houston is the only city that has, the only major city that has had two women mayors. And that doesn't come out of nowhere. That comes out of a sense that women have been active all along. I mean, uh, Ovita Kolpavi was active, not just in forming the WAX during the uh, Second World War, but also in running the Houston Post. So she was a, you know, an active part of the business scene and the political scene um, all along and part of a political family obviously. Um, and then Kathy Whitmire was the mayor um, for 10 years in, you know, from, was it 82 to, seven, to 91? 82 to 91, I think. And, you know, neither LA nor New York has ever had a woman mayor. And Chicago had one for one term, four years. And that was back in the 70s. Uh, so now after Kathy Whitmire, we've now had Anise Parker, uh, for four years, so that means out of the past 32 years we've had a woman leader for 14 years. That's highly unusual across the country. Uh, and it bespeaks uh, an act of women's presence. And, you know, a part of it's that Houston is a newer city. Uh, and so people say this all the time about Houston. You know, if you come to Houston with a sense of what you want to do, you can get it done because people respect a can-do attitude and, you know, there's a lot of room. Everything isn't already taken in the way that a lot of, you know, you go to the to New York, there's a sense that, you know, everybody, everything's already been done, all the, everything's established. But in Houston, there's room for anybody, including women. So that's also something that has made it open to lots of different ethnic groups, lots of different, you know, international groups, people coming here, they have a sense that there's, there's more room uh, for people to define things on their own terms. So I think that include, that is, something about Houston that is also um, affects the way women have participated and means that women uh, have had more, uh, maybe more history here than they might have had elsewhere. Not um, at, at all, I mean, obviously women have been active all around, but they've been more uh, involved at the higher levels um, than they have been in some other places. So that's exciting. You know, Sam Houston, I always like him as the model. Sam Houston was the governor of Tennessee before he came to Houston. <laughs> he was kidnapped by Indians and sort of had a change of life uh, and came back and reinvented himself. And so he's, the, he's our namesake and uh, that's sort of a model for, for reinvention. Archives. Um, that's a national phenomenon, and uh, because uh, we do living archives on topics of interest to women, uh, and you asked, you know, how do we come up with these topics? Well, we uh, ask people, you know, what's interesting to you? What's going on that's of interest? Um, we try to document what people tell us is interesting, and then also what we notice. And at one point, uh, I was talking with um, Dina Alsawayel, the Associate Director of Women's Studies, and uh, thinking about different topics, and um, we realized that not only we, but many of the people we knew had had our first child uh, by birth or adoption much later than our mothers had done, and that that was, you know, a very common phenomenon um, across across the country. Uh, you know, in the celebrity news as well as in per personal interactions that people had had, and very little had been done to um, explore what that meant. So we uh, did a panel on that topic and I s continued doing research and ended up writing a book about it, interviewing lots of people, many of them Houstonians, but uh, many of them from around the country as well. And uh, figured out that, you know, uh, things have changed largely uh, due to changes in fertility dynamics where specifically hormonal birth control uh, in 1960, but really it had begun way back in the 19th century with the invention of rubber, which was the beginning of birth control. And in fact, the bigger uh, decline in the birth rate occurred in the 19th century than in the 20th century, which people wouldn't necessarily know because in 1800, the average woman had seven children, and in 1900, she had 3.5. So that it was halved uh, in, in that century. And then in the 21st century, in, in, in 2000, the average woman in the U.S. had two 2.0. So that was, you know, 
also a major decline, but not as large as the initial one. So uh, we're looking at, uh, I learned that delay was a kind of means by which people built in time for their own education and to establish at work. And then they ended up still having, uh, you know, whether they started early or late, they averaged uh, about two children. So it's not that they necessarily had a different number of children um, in choosing to delay, though some had fewer. Uh, and some had none, um, but it changed the way women could participate in society because, first of all, they weren't spending all their time bearing and rearing children because that takes a lot of effort to raise 12, seven, you know, however many large number of children. Uh, and they also um, were being educated in a different way so they could participate in business and government in a different way, and then they started earning money, which meant they had a different influence than when they didn't have their own money. So all these things came together to affect the way um, women participate in, in society. So it's really fascinating, I think, but it's, a, it's something that everybody is expert about because everybody is sizing up the landscape for themselves. And it's not just women, obviously, it's their partners too, because then Men also are now later, you know, starting their families later because it, it's a partnership uh, and uh, everybody's lives are affected. Yes, I ended up calling the book Ready because that's what everybody said. You know, I had kids when I was ready. <laughs> and it frequently was financial and frequently had to do with finding the right partner. People didn't find the right person for, the, you know, it takes a while. Sometimes people feel they don't grow up as fast as they used to maybe because they have a longer horizon for longevity than they used to. They don't feel like they have that same pressure to have their kids before they die, you know, because they're not going to die when they're 50 or they, you know, on average, they're going to have different uh, life choices. Yes, we'll knock on wood. <laughs>